Okay, so we've had a, a 12 year overview of SAM tools. I'm going to give you a, a 20 year plus overview of the uh, MBOSS project. I hope to entertain you and uh, bring you up to date on, on what's about to happen with MBOSS. So MBOSS is the European Molecular Biology Open Software Suite. It's a suite of applications for originally sequence analysis and data retrieval. It's expanded in its scope over time. Written entirely in C, um, we GPL licensed it, which has proved to be a very good decision over time. There's some 270 applications in MBOSS itself, but we also added 15 MBOSS associated packages. We call them Embassy. Um, including things like Hammer, Filet, Vienna, and uh, customize those to, to work under MBOSS. Uh, it's developed uh, when I was at uh, um, Sanger Center at Lion Bioscience and European Bioinformatics Institute, and we've had, I'll, I'll show them all at the end, collaborations and contributions worldwide. Uh, one of our pro proud boasts, and I've heard this from other projects as well, is that we had users in every continent, including Antarctica, and we have the photo. So this is uh, Melody Clark from the British Antarctic Survey, who went to Antarctica and took MBOSS with her. Um, I should point out the British Antarctic Survey were about 10 kilometres away from us. They weren't our most remote <laughs> users, in fact. Um, our first MBOSS course was a year before the first release, but we were in Beijing, um, several of the MBOSS developers, and we presented MBOSS to a Chinese um, workshop audience. Um, we had a, an interface web emboss that was developed by users in Canada, Argentina and Belgium across three continents. Um, and we also worked very much with the European Molecular Biology Network. It was a network of national bioinformatics services providing databases and sequence analysis software and all of those adopted emboss. So this is a, the current map of where the EMBNET centres are in uh, Europe. There were a couple of extra ones at the time, and I see some new ones have appeared. Um, but it wasn't actually European entirely. It spread worldwide. I mentioned China, Argentina, and, and Canada. Um, there's Australia, uh, South Africa, and a couple of other sites in Africa. We did have trouble with Australia. They're supposed to have a national node, and so we had to turn them down when they wanted to have another node in Western Australia because it's the, the same country. We had a lot of users in industry, so in large companies in the pharmaceutical industry with their in-house bioinformatics groups, they were very keen to take up MBOSS and we had very close links to them. Um, also small biotechs who had no in-house expertise and wanted something that was supported out in the community and they could easily install and work with. Um, companies providing bioinformatics solutions and bioinformatics services were very keen because they could then sell their services using MBOSS. We had no problem with that. Um, they often put new interfaces on top. Um, anybody producing workflows and pipelines also put their own interface on top of MBOSS. Um, and it proved to be very easy for reasons that I'll, I'll come to. Uh, hardware manufacturers were extremely keen that MBOSS should work on, say, IBM, um, HP and other systems. And they were happy to lend us hardware to make sure that every release was tested on, on their hardware. And yeah, the same for anybody providing operating systems and, and other software. We made sure that we could work with them. Uh, the community we, we built up was a, a community of developers who were providing applications, some one or two applications, some providing libraries, some providing very detailed extra contributions, um, not part of the project, but just adding everything in. Um, people providing bioinformatics services, we had requests for new features and bug reports so all of the EMB net nodes, for example, were very good at uh, providing requests from their users. Um, and each one had a different user community or focus on different areas. Um, they produced their own user interfaces. Each one liked to have their own interface to their services and MBOSS fitted very nicely under it. Um, and so every time we checked, there was a, another interface with another developer behind it. They were also extremely good at writing documentation, user guides. Uh, for their users, which they were very happy to share with everybody else. In industry, there were two classes of users. There were the um, pharmaceutical industry users, where it's pre-competitive and they would meet with the EBI industry program. And we were able to present MBOSS while it was in development and got a very good reception from them. And it was essential for the small companies, small to medium enterprises to have MBOSS freely available 
um, not just freely available, but because it's GPL licensed. There was a big issue at the time that if you paid um, several thousand pounds or tens of thousand pounds for software, you were always at risk that the company you bought it from might disappear and then you don't have any software. Whereas if you use open source software like Emboss, they began to realize that you're safe. Emboss could disappear and you would still have the software and you would still have a support community out there. And that certainly drove a lot of them to be very keen on open source software afterwards. Uh, key to that was the command line interface that we built. So Emboss applications all run from the command line. Um, it's not the only interface. So every time we checked, there were at least 50 interfaces that we found, and we, we suspect at least as many others. Web interfaces, there was a GUI in Java, which we, we maintained. Uh, web service interface was maintained by another group, another guy at uh, EBI. Uh, various workflow interfaces. So Taverna came from EBI, Galaxy. Uh, Pipeline Pilot from a, another company, which finished up working with us. And uh, we also wrote a Windows interface um, called Memboss, basically compiling Memboss on Windows, although personally I just ran it on Sigwin. Uh, the reason for that is all the applications have one file, which is a, a command definition file called ACD. It defined all of the inputs, all of the outputs, and all of the other options of the program. And it was read by one line at startup. There was an initialization command that gave the name of the file. Um, it automatically opened all the sequence streams, read all the sequences, checked they were the right type, applied all of the other um, command line options and validated them, and then returned to the program. And the program would then pick up the sequence that had been opened. It would write to the output file that had been opened, and everything runs smoothly from there. But of course, you can use that definition file to define your interface. So you can then put it under any other interface, and it pretty much generates itself. We uh, had very extensive database support. So you could um, define a number of data access methods to access uh, data through SRS or indexed flat file databases. Um, you could have one server with a uh, hundred databases, uh, for example, using SRS, which was a, a product we worked closely with for many years. Uh, also REST and SOAP services you could access. And we built a data resource catalog of other data sets that you could get to. Um, under the hood, there was a query language. So if you said that Emboss would read a sequence, that just tells you it's a sequence, but you could actually specify the file name. If you just give the file name, it would um, go through a candidate set of formats and decide what the format was. And you almost never needed to tell it which format you were using. There were just a few cases where there were several possibilities and you had to say which version of say fast a format you were using because there were several ways to interpret the identifiers in fast a if you have a database defined with an index somewhere you could define the database name and the identifier or the database name and some field like the accession number and give an accession number and it would go and retrieve it and you could apply those to the file name as well if you have a, a file name with more than one sequence you can pull one sequence by id or by accession uh, we extended that in more recent versions to have uh, a list of identifiers that you could pull. And we had various operators like combining um, operators with ands and ors and nots. We also added some ontologies in there. So Pimboss defines um, the topic of the application, the operation it performs, the data that comes in, the formats and identifiers that are used. Um, that's all in the ACD file, and we have other information in uh, the data catalog. Uh, we had SOAP web services that were built from it. We had the uh, emboss programs were put into groups like nucleotide sequence analysis, and we had access to OBO ontologies. Um, we categorized all of these in the ACD files, and out of that came a, an ontology called EDAM, uh, emboss data and methods. Uh, which is now maintained by Elixir Denmark as the, the European Research Infrastructure Standard for Bioinformatics Tools. Uh, so we had yeah, some 400 applications in, in Emboss to kick it off, and then it's grown from there. And it's still maintained by John Ison, who was the guy who um, set it up in the Emboss group at EBI long, long ago. The data catalog um, needs some updates. It's it's gone a little bit out of date, so that's one of the things that's going to be a focus before we can release a, 
an updated version. Um, but the idea was to find all of the data resources out there and what sort of data you can return and what sort of identifiers they have, what their cross-referencing capabilities are, and put them into a data resource catalog so you can retrieve entries from remote servers. Um, and again, annotate them in EDAM and use a set of standard index fields to do the queries. Out of all that, we started publishing books. And so there are three emboss books that we uh, wanted to produce, a user's guide, administrator's guide, and a developer's guide. And we went around all of the publishers that we could find. Um, our criterion was that we wanted to have control of the text. We didn't want it to be copyright the publisher and we could never touch it again because this was a uh, normal user guides. And uh, we found Cambridge University Press just up the road was much the most friendly. And we have the rights to the English text. We can just make changes and reuse it on websites. And they have the rights to all the translations and anything else that's developed afterwards. A couple of other books came out as well. Um, the sequence and analysis in a nutshell was written by two guys who finished up at Lion Bioscience when I was there. Um, it says covered emboss. And at the back of the book is a joke. They added the emboss application that does not exist. Um, it was a good idea. And so we wrote the application that does not exist. It may have disappointed them, but it, it predicts um, what happens when you use um, a sequence for target of her as a target for drug development. Um, it's pessimistic, but it has all of the command line options that they defined for it and does the job they asked for. Uh, the other book there, Public or Private Economies of Knowledge, um, we were actually the subject of some research in social sciences. And so a group of social scientists came along and talk to us and uh, they were very interested in where emboss came from and so we told them the story of how life started and how it came that we had to produce an open source package called emboss and they were so fascinated there's actually a, a large section in that book on the story of, of how emboss came to be developed from an open source project so way back long ago um, it all started with the wisconsin package it was um, Oliver Smithy's group at the University of Wisconsin started uh, releasing sequence analysis um, applications. And when they published um, the first version of GCG, the license was quite interesting. The license says, any scientist using our software are encouraged to use existing programs as a framework for developing new ones. Our copyright can be removed from any program modified by more than 25% of our original effort. That's a really nice, friendly license. Unfortunately, I didn't see GCG until 1987 and the license had changed. You now bought a, a copy of the, the software with the source code and you had the right to use it and that license had gone because um, I have certainly changed more than 25% of GCG since then. Um, but while I was at EMBL in Heidelberg, there were many requests for new programs. Um, so I was supporting GCG, the source code was there. And so we started writing new programs. And these went through various name changes and finished up being called eGCG or extended GCG. And in seven years in Heidelberg, we went up to GCG version 8 and eGCG version 8, and everybody was very happy. So then, um, yeah, I moved from eGCG and went to Sanger to join the new um, genome projects. We were supporting some 3,000 UK scientists at two national services as well who were running eGCG. Uh, many, many more worldwide. Um, and then things got kind of nasty, particularly in the US with open source software. Um, there were attempts to close down sites that were developing open source software because it should be done by companies. Um, six companies objected to one particular site. Um, GCG was one of those sites. And then they turned on each other and one of the other companies turned on um, the GCG group. And so they spun off GCG Inc. Um, it now had private source code though. They decided their asset was their source code. So eGCG could continue. I now had a $1 license for a copy of the source code. Um, but the trouble is nobody else had the source code. So nobody else was contributing programs anymore. So it was time for a rethink. The, the old strategy wasn't really working. So what we did was sent a proposal to the Wellcome Trust. Um, we wanted to write an open source software suite for sequence analysis under GPL. We would rewrite all of the most useful applications that we'd had before in eGCG. We were now up to 40,000 users worldwide at all of the EMBnet nodes. Um, we know there were two referees who saw the proposal. 
One report was sent to us. It was absolutely damning to say it could only be done by commercial outfits. This was one of these guys that you know, believes open source software is evil and companies must take over and provide the support and charge the money. We wrote a really long response that disagreed. We also said we'd love to see the, the other reports. We never saw them. Um, we now know who the referees were. Um, I was ticked off who the, the other one actually told me he was, he was reviewing it um, and said he just wrote a hymn of praise. I think I know who the other one was. And then I was at a conference wearing my embossed sweatshirt and someone came up and said, oh, emboss should never have been funded. And I thought, I knew it was you. But we got the money and we got our funding to develop emboss and in three years we produced the entire package. There was still a question of what to do with the old applications. So we had eGCG. We proposed to release it to GCG as long as they would release it back to us and we could reuse the code. Um, their answer was we cannot quit claim to the code because of the style and it uses our libraries, which is kind of fair enough. And we simply said, well, we can't quit claim to it either, so you can't let anybody use it. And so it died. Um, when Emboss 1.0 came out, it, I just deleted all copies of it and I no longer have any access to it. Many users asked for it. We just passed them on to GCG. GCG asked me. I reminded GCG it was up to them and they never shifted. Except for one user, because after I left Sanger, one user there still wanted to use one of the programs that they'd actually used in Heidelberg originally. Um, they were at Sanger. The source code was still there on backup tapes. And so they were actually able to install it and reuse it, but I couldn't look at it because I'd moved on. Um, but they were very happy with it. So the embossed team at Sanger, I had Ian Longdon, who was the, the main programmer for writing all the libraries. And at Daresbury Laboratory, um, further up in the UK near Manchester, we had Alan Bleesby and John Ison, who ran the um, BDSSC Biological Science Research Council funded um, national service and um, a couple of group leaders at EDI and worldwide through uh, all the EMBnet centres. But one of the first things that happened was that BBSRC closed the Dalesbury Laboratory. And so Alan and John moved to Hingston. So our travel budget was kind of useless because we were then all on one campus um, within a few metres of each other. Emboss version 1 came out in 2000 on St Swithin's Day, July the 15th. And the story of St Swithin's Day is if it rains on St Swithin's Day, it will rain for 40 days and 40 nights. If it's sunny on St Swithin's Day, it will be sunny for 40 days and 40 nights. And uh, we thought this was a nice, nice way to describe a release because it's summer. And so we said, here's Emboss 1.0. If it works, we guarantee it'll work for 40 days and 40 nights because we're on holiday. And if it's broken, similarly, it'll be broken for 40 days because we won't be able to fix it until we get back. And uh, that has worked ever since every release has been on July the 15th. Um, our first bug report for Emboss actually came from Solera. Um, we were at Sanger at the time. And uh, at Sanger, if you got a bug report from Solera, you thought, well, should I be supporting these guys? They're the, the commercial genome project. But we fixed it for them. And that was a good idea because when I was at Lion, they funded an Emboss support position. So we planned for some disasters. What happens when people move? Uh, as I mentioned, I've moved from Sanger to Lion and then to EBI. Um, there are various other moves. So I moved to Lion Bioscience. I was now integrating Emboss into SRS, Lion's database integration product. Um, we built a database of Emboss, in fact, so Emboss code was now a database in SRS. Development moved to Hingston, so Alan and John at HGMP were the lead developers. We were funded through BBSRC and uh, CCP11 Collaborative Computing Program for bioinformatics. It was all GPL, so it could move around very happily. At Lion, we were integrating it under SRS, so we needed to be sure it worked. So we added a comprehensive testing suite uh, to make sure that every application would run um, exactly the right way. Um, we extended that so that the user manual was written by the test suite. So there was a test application for the program that became the example and the documentation, example inputs and example outputs, and everything was created automatically. Lion would also have liked to integrate GCG under their um, SRS platform, but GCG refused. So a side effect of that was I started writing marketing material so that Lion could tell their customers what Emboss was. And we rather hope they'd sell support to Emboss. 
yeah, people just picked up emboss and ran it under SRS happily. A few more moves. In 2003, I returned to Hingston. I left Lion and went to EBI, um, working on data and tool integration. So again, taking a keen interest in emboss and uh, again, linking it with SRS because the EBI was the, the main center running SRS. Um, other guys at uh, EBI in my group were developing Taverna workflows and Soap Lab services and integrating those with MBOSS. And so we carried on that way with um, HGMP leading the project until the next year, 2004, the Medical Research Council was looking for somewhere to close and they closed HGMP. So one UK national service had closed already. This was the other one and UK lost all of its national bioinformatics services. Um, they finally formally closed in 2005. Um, but the interesting thing is that Alan and John weren't funded by MRC, they were funded by BBSRC, the Biological Sciences Council. So we went back to them and said, you know, you were funding these guys, you liked what they did. Would you like to give us the money to fund them and we'll take them on? And that's what happened. So we had funding from BBSRC to move Alan and John over. And then I took over EMBOSS under the EBI umbrella. Other people joined us from HGMP as it closed and from Lion, we picked up Mamadou Ladag, we picked up Lisa Mullen, who did all the, the user training and documentation. Uh, Tim Carver, who did the GenBoss interface, moved to Sanger. And so there was still a good team in Hingston. Um, we carried on making more and more releases until 2011, it was time to leave EBI. You get nine years at uh, the MBL institutions. And I carried on working on it for another year. Emboss 6.7 came out July the 15th again in 2012. And there's a few other um, bug reports and changes to come out at some point. Since then, I've actually been uh, pretty much full time working on Transmart and more recently on I2B2 for precision medicine projects. So Transmart has, sorry, Emboss has been sitting around waiting for uh, somebody to pick it up. And I'm about to pick it up again. So what else could go wrong with uh, with a project? One of the issues we found was we had a wiki. Um, we moved Emboss onto uh, openbio.org and uh, we had a wiki there and their server crashed and there was no backup of, of the wiki. Um, but fortunately, um, we found that Google caches pages. So if we did a quick search for Emboss and the names of all the applications, we could very quickly recover the all of the pages in the wiki and we've screen scraped them all ready to, to repopulate. Um, Bio Ruby, I think, and one other of the open bio projects had the same issue and followed our lead and managed to get their wikis back as well. Our source code has moved many times. We started with a CVS server at Sanger while we were developing the first version. We then, when I left Sanger, we moved it to HGMP and kept the code on the server there. We lost some um, code updates in between, but we kept the latest code and maintained it. Uh, when HGMP closed, we switched to using a CVS server at OpenBio, and then that system crash that took out the wiki, unfortunately also took out our code server. And so now we, I'm afraid, lost all the, re um, the record of all the changes. Um, we waited a while while OpenBio looked through any other old backups to see if there was anything they could do to help. Um, we couldn't find anything. So we're now moving to GitHub, there's a, a GitHub location there. It's up to, I think, about version 6.4 now. We're just putting the rest of the changes in. We went back through all of the past Emboss releases we could find, and we started with the very oldest actual release code and put that into GitHub, and then we replaced it with the next version and catalogued all the changes and committed them. And so there are release branches and there are notes of all the code changes and we're best we can, we reconstructed the reasons for them, for all the releases, and we'll take that up to the 6.7 release, and then we can go through all the changes since then and keep things up to date on, uh, on GitHub. So Arise of Bioinformatics is actually me. It's just a, a one-man company I set up, um, Arise being the rice genus. And so we'll be looking after Emboss from now on. Uh, our future plans, um, Planning to do some updates and releasing Emboss 7 uh, July the 15th next year, of course. We'll have to test with the latest compilers. We always were very picky that Emboss must compile without any warnings against all compilers. 
updating test data sets to the latest release. So we'll pick the example entries out of the databases and make sure that MBOSS is happy with them. Um, we'll update all the databases to the, the latest versions. Update the EDAM terms in the ACD files because EDAM has evolved a little bit since then. Um, update the cat data catalog and clean out any databases that don't exist and add any others that we can find. Update the embassy packages. Um, most of those have got more recent versions we can integrate. And look at ideas for new features. Um, and we're looking to version 7 and beyond. Um, Emboss is, can handle any kind of data, really. We just need to extend the libraries to do useful things with different data types. So I think there's a lot that we can do in the, the near future. And acknowledgements to everyone who was at EBI, at HGMP, or the, briefly the Rosalind Franklin Center for Genomics Research, um, Lion Bioscience, Sanger Institute, all the EMB Net National Service providers who are really helpful to us, and many others who've contributed to EMBOSS, or in some cases we have lifted their code with permission, like Don Gilbert and Bill Pearson, very happy for us to, and Webb Miller, very happy for us to take their code and integrate it into EMBOSS. And Cambridge University Press, Lion Bioscience, and IBM, HP Compaq, and everyone who gave us hardware to help um, Microsoft Research and the Open Bio Foundation and SourceForge who supported us. And of course, the British Antarctic Survey for letting us say we have users in Antarctica. Thank you. Th thank you so much, Peter. Uh, this was a really fantastic talk. fantastic talk. And my question, my first question is really going to be um, about, uh, about your enthusiasm. How did you manage for all these years to, to and all those and through all those difficulties actually keep fighting for what you knew was right and actually i mean a lot of those um those things you talked about all of those struggles you talked about um you know i, th I think you, you 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 turned out to be on the right side of the of the history like we've these are the conversations uh, you know as an open source as an open source company founder i i no longer need to have with any of my investors or any of my, uh, you know, any of my sort of commercial contacts. It's, um, but like, how did you manage against all those difficulties to keep keep enthusiasm and keep going with the project for for many many years? It's the power of the forty thousand users. So it goes back to when I first started writing applications at Ian Heidelberg. I'm actually talking to the researchers, the postdocs who need something written, and so the postdocs would come along and say, "Can you give me something that will predict a signal peptide?" from a protein sequence, for example, uh, one of the first applications we did. And that's, that's very rewarding when you can produce an application and they're very happy and it's useful. Then you get the group leaders coming to you and the group leader says, I've got a paper coming up in Nature on uh, homeoboxes and I need to publish um, a figure tomorrow <laughs> mm -hmm. in a way that ECG can't do. Can you please generate the figure for me? And it's, it's a direct interaction with the users then. And it's really, really rewarding when you see how much you've helped them. Um, you don't get the direct benefit. You don't get on the nature paper just because you did the figure. Mm -hmm. But you know they're helpful and the word spreads around the lab then. Um, I then moved to, uh, to Sanger. And then at Sanger, I'm talking to genome sequences. And then it's kind of removed. It's the genome sequence users that you're thinking of who are really the beneficiaries for most of the applications. Um, but we did things like we extended um, the software to cope with GCG had a sequence limit of 350,000. They thought no sequence would be bigger than that. And so one of our advantages was we could have sequences that were big enough to cope with the yeast chromosomes that they were sequencing at Sanger. And that's, you know, immediately you're, you're in with them then. And we also had some eGCG programs which um, we updated and improved so they could handle large sequences and, and run things through really quickly. Um, when I was at Lion, it's even more removed. You're dealing with companies who then provide support to people. But you still know those 40,000 people and how much they depend on this. And the, the good feeling still comes back that you know how many people you're helping. Yeah, well, you, users first seems to be the, seems to be the answer. Um, wow. Uh, yeah, that's, 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 that's incredible. Um, Peter, my, um, uh, the, the other question I wanted to ask you was really about the was really about the license. So, um, in the beginning of your talk, you said um, you said that you really you, you thought that uh, the GPL was a great choice. 
Um, and at first, I was taken aback by this a little bit because um, G GPL can can be a difficult license to work with. But then, obviously, you provided the historical perspective that the alternative was, uh, you know, was closed source or was um, was one dollar per source code, but no contribution, or was an ill-defined license which says that you can keep the code if you provide twenty-five percent of effort, but no real way to measure the, the effort. The, the key is if, if you don't have an open source license of some sort or a free license, then mm -hmm. if you're a company, somebody can take your software away. Uh, yes. Well, that's a, yeah. Lion effectively did that. Lion bought up a company um, for the purpose of getting their users. Yeah, but, but my question is... closed down the company's software and sold SRS to the, their customers instead. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But but my question is really just about the variety of licenses which are available just now. So, for example, all of, Bi all of Biomajor's code is um, licensed un under the MIT license, which is, in fact, more permissive than, than GPL, and it prevents it prevents um, us from from certain certain issues such as, for example, GPL is a viral license. It will be difficult to it'll be, it'll be difficult to embed um, to embed the software in um, in certain scenarios, and certain paths for commercialization are are in fact are in fact hindered. Uh, actually, it's, it's it's not all GPL. So the libraries are LGPL. So you could write mm -hmm. other applications that use the libraries, um, including calling ACD files and so on. All of that would be LGPL, and that would work. Um, but most of the emboss integration has been at the level of an interface and so you have an interface that calls emboss it is not binary linked to it and so gpl doesn't impact um, the only time we had trouble with it was we talked to microsoft research and they were very very scared the moment you walk into microsoft mm -hmm. and say gpl i see yes yeah, and there definitely i can <laughs> we like to say they showed us out the back door actually that was the shortcut back to our car <laughs> <laughs> wonderful, wonderful! Uh, all the anecdotes, I, I, I love them. Um, Peter, we do have to move on to our next speaker. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you so much for for an incredibly entertaining talk. Um, and I, I'm looking forward to our interactions in the future. I uh, I've learned so much more about Emboss, uh, and I think I feel richer as a result. Yes, I'll be looking with, looking to you for some new Emboss application ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, Peter.